All right. Well, uh, thanks again for the invitation, Ali. Always happy to be part of this session uh, with some great interactive discussions with, with all of you and, and the, um, the audience that we have here. So uh, these are some recent cases I've done over the last few months, and hopefully it'll stimulate some, some pretty good discussion. So uh, this first gentleman is a 61-year-old guy. He's got a history of prostate cancer diagnosed uh, this past October, and he was referred to us um, really not because he was symptomatic, but he was having some surveillance scans and he was found to have multiple um, multiple blastic lesions throughout his entire vertebral column. Essentially, he's a neurologically intact, independent ambulator and really denied any uh, significant discomfort. And um, he was essentially sent to us because of these uh, lytic lesions we found in his uh, uh, cervical spine. Uh, we could see some pretty typical blastic features. Um, that's characteristic of prostate cancer. And I'm not sure if you're able to pick up on it, but it actually looks like that he's got a unilateral uh, pars fracture as well here. So this was the first scan that he had back um, in January. And uh, fast forward, this is his MRI scan around the same time. And we really see that he's got no significant disease here at this, at this juncture in time. I'm not sure, is Wendy logged on here as well? I'm not sure if you have any additional input based on these scans of things that you see here. All right, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just carry on. So at, th at this point in time, as far as management options, um, you know, I, I don't think many people would have chosen the surgical route. I really didn't see a, a, a singular area that we could address. Neurologically, he was intact. He really had no mechanical neck pain. So we really just um, you know, had a discussion with him about having some radiation therapy. And I think that was very reasonable to follow up in a few weeks um, uh, with some upright flexion extension x-ray to make sure that that fracture was, was behaving appropriately. So uh, I kind of lost him to follow up, unfortunately, over the, uh, the course of those seven months. And he presented back to us a neurological extremis uh, just a few weeks ago, actually. He was unable to use his uh, left upper extremity. Um, his left lower extremity was very weak as well. And this happened pretty rapidly over a short period of time, about two days. He was also having some urinary retention as well and severe mechanical neck pain. He really couldn't hold his, his neck up at this point. And he was essentially monoplegic in his left upper extremity and left lower extremity, he was, he was monoparetic. So at this point in time, we have to think about what further imaging and workup we wanna get. So we started off with some upright x-rays and we could see that he's got a very straight spine if not even slightly kyphotic and his neck is kind of uh, cocked off towards the right side here. These are his upright uh, thoracic x-rays. He does have a little bit of upper thoracic scoliosis, which is essentially irrelevant here. And here's his new CAT scan. And again, we could see all of these lytic lesions and mixed blastic lytic lesions, but now we see that in the, uh, the upper cervical spine and subaxial cervical spine, he's got much more destruction now of the facet joints and of the uh, poster elements. And here's his new MRI scan. And this is, this is after he's had chemo, immunotherapy, and radiation. We could see that he's got very profound spinal cord compression at multiple levels, and he has T2 port signal change um, essentially up to about the C1, C2 level as well. So we're in a bit of a predicament here because he, he's, not, um, he's not the healthiest guy in the world. Uh, he's an independent ambulator, like I said. He has some other medical comorbidities, um, but during his medical workup, when he came into the hospital, we found that he also had asymptomatic bilateral pulmonary emboli. Um, these were his vital signs, relatively stable, aside from being a little bit on the hypertensive side, saturating okay on, on Rumer. So at this point in time, you know, we'll kind of open up the forum to everyone and see what management options would be. You know, would, would we submit him to palliative radiation, collar, halo surgery? And um, if you did do surgery, is this something that you would red strip? Uh, in Upstate University, that's an emergency operation that we try to get done within about a couple of hours by the time the patient presents, or is this something that you might want to delay uh, start on anticoagulation for these PE? So I'm just curious what everyone else would really do out there in the situation, given his rapid decline. Hey, Mike, I, I think I see here a nodder. I'm sure he wants to chime in, but I want to ask you a question about the uh, evaluation and, and the radiology before we jump to management. If you can sure. go back to the CAT scan, uh, not uh, exactly, yep, exactly, this CAT scan. So I, I have a question for you. This comes up once in a while. Let's say, so this patient came back, obviously acute neurological deficits. You know, you're worried about spinal cord compression. You get the CAT scan and it shows exactly what, what you're showing us here. And the guy, let's just say the guy has a pacemaker, he cannot get an MRI. He's not getting an MRI, period. 
Uh, what do you do in your practice and in your institution for a case exactly like this? You're seeing based on the CAT scan where a lot of the, you know, the lesion is, and it's, you know, kind of centered around that C, I guess it was C3, C3, 4, C2 to C4. Would you take him for a decompression or, or decompression infusion right there? Or would you get a CT Milo before you take this guy to surgery if he cannot get an MRI? And Mike, well, I have an answer for you too, half yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, oh, I have a good radiology trick, and Wendy, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but something a radiologist uh, taught me a few years ago was to actually uh, place the windowing onto the abdominal view. And sometimes you could, believe it or not, and I'm sure Wendy knows this, can, can make out the, the confines of the spinal cord and whether or not there's epidural compression. So that's kind of one trick that I'll, I'll use with just a plain CT. But in this situation, I would absolutely uh, vouch to get a CT myelogram first, just because I, I really wouldn't know the extent of the spinal stenosis. I would obviously have a, a hunch that there is severe cord compression, but I really don't know that I would know how, uh, how far down I should take his decompression, right, without some type of uh, more definitive radiographic imaging. Yeah, I agree with that. Sorry, and before when you were asking me, I, I had walked across the room. I couldn't get back to the oh, microphone okay. at time. And unfortunately, I don't have a camera on this computer. But um, I, I totally agree with you. With the windowing, you can do that a little bit, maybe down to the C5 level. Usually below that, you can't see very well. But myelogram would absolutely help you. And you kind of, like you said, between their symptoms, which I think is probably you're going to say is the most important aspect of the whole case, more than the imaging. Um, You'll, you'll be able to see well enough with the myelogram what, how far down you probably need to go. And it, I, one other thing about the pulmonary emboli, if they're asymptomatic and they're peripheral, you probably don't need to do anything about those, right? Right, and, and that was my thought with this as well. So we'll fast forward. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious, Nader, what would you do in this situation? It, you know, he's having a pretty rapid decline. Uh, he's a pretty independent guy. Systemic disease profile is, is favorable. He really only has... Uh, osseous disease. He's got a couple spots in his shoulders and basically his vertebral column. And that's really it. Otherwise, he's, he's doing okay systemically. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you touched upon two important uh, things. When I evaluate a patient, even if it's an emergency with the known metastasis, remember it's stage four and we're trying to palliate. We're trying to prevent worsening a deficit and to help with pain. So two things I definitely I want to get checked right away if possible. If he's an established patient, is his prognosis, you know, is this guy who I'm going to operate on potentially going to leave the hospital? If the answer is no, then no surgery. The other thing is the Karnofsky score, pretty functional, uh, otherwise healthy, not, you know, functional more than, more than healthy. It doesn't look to be healthy. And if these are a go, so it's Karnofsky more than 70 and um, the prognosis more than uh, six months, say three to six months, then I want to treat this. And definitely this is a surgical case as spinal cord compression, this spinal cord needs to be decompressed. Now in terms of the PE, uh, certainly that's a high risk. I mean, it's one of the highest risk factors for a PE and a spine surgeon is at, in a spine um, patient undergoing surgery is a pre-existing uh, tumor uh, or a spinal cord injury patient after a fracture or a patient who has had the PSO. We studied that, but, but definitely tumor burden would increase the risk of a VTE. I'll certainly put an IVC filter in that patient and then uh, proceed with an operation. Now, preoperative embolization, this will bleed. I mean, I have experience with prostate cancer, extremely hemorrhagic tumors sometimes in the cervical spine, uh, supply from the vert. Uh, Pre-op embolization now, you know, if it can be done in an expedited fashion, certainly um, uh, I would do that. No MR, CT myelogram. Right. And, and actually, here's the CTA we wanted to assess the left vertebral artery. And you could actually make out the, the epidural compression here with just a CT angiogram as well. So, um, so we decided to take him to surgery. You know, we had him medically worked up, but we did take him within about 12 hours of him uh, getting to the hospital. And we got uh, pre-positioning baselines. And as expected, he had decreased uh, left upper and lower extremity MEPs and SSCPs. They were still monitorable, but they were definitely down, especially his MEPs. So uh, what happened was, you know, we put him in the Mayfield. I'm, I'm old school. I don't really use bivector traction, at least just yet. And we flipped him into the prone position. And once we locked him in place, uh, we looked like we had good neutral head position. We basically lost all of our signals at that point, including on the right side. 
And we did take an x-ray and he was completely neutral. He wasn't hyperextended, was not hyperflexed. His, his maps were about 80 at that point in time. So um, I'm curious, what would you guys do in this situation? I can't say I've been in this situation many times. It happened once or twice when I was at Brown with Zia and he would actually flip prone with the patient awake. Um, but in my own practice in the last three years, I can't say that I've really lost signals more than one other time. And it corrected with just a subtle re-head positioning. So what would you guys do here? So options, right? Can we, do we flip back supine? And, you know, I had my uh, PGY4 resident with me. He's fantastic. I said, oh, okay, George, nope. what do you want to do? Do you want to flip back? Do you want to go commando, decompress him? And so, you know, why don't we flip back into the supine position? And I think that's, that's the logical answer. Wake them up. Okay, we wake them up. Motors come back. It's if he's come back. Okay, now what? Are we going to flip them back into the prone position? Then what happens if you lose motors again? Right. So it's kind of a conundrum that you're in in this situation. And um, it was it was a tough call for me. But I guess uh, the way I looked at it was we, we took an X-ray. Everything looks stable. And I said, we know we have to a, decompress the spinal cord and B, we know we have to stabilize him because he's unstable. So I kind of changed the order of my operation at that point. I usually like to put all my hardware first, then decompress. But instead, we basically went commando style. We did a very quick expeditious opening and we decompressed everything from C2 down to about C7. And he had really, really profound spinal cord compression. And as Nada alluded to, uh, this really bled like stink. It was a very, very hemorrhagic tumor. Um, and uh, lo and behold, we actually got his signals back to baseline um, uh, about an hour or so after we decompressed him. So I do think in retrospect, that was the right move to make. But it, it's a very tough decision at that point in time. I think if you're doing an elective case, obviously, your management is very different. You're not going to proceed. You're going to flip back supine. You're going to, uh, you know, might even wake the patient up, maybe even cancel the surgery possibly or postpone it. So I'm curious what your guys' thoughts were about the decision to just proceed given the, the loss of basically of all signals with positioning and a, a, a neutral um, x-ray like this. I think, uh, I, I think Mike, that, you know, you, you, you really did everything right here. I mean, it's, it's an urgent case. You know, he needs to be decompressed. You still have to go through the, the motion and, uh, uh, like you did and you, and you talk to, to your resident, you know, uh, look at an x-ray, make sure the head is neutral, make sure they're not hyperflexed, hyperextended, check the leads. Uh, and then you have a couple of options. Um, I, I'm not personally a big fan of flipping back to the, you know, to the stretcher and, and, and doing a wake up test that way. In my elective cases, I may do a wake up test in the prone position, you know, just, you know, kind of uh, slow down the, the profile just a little bit, you know, just enough to get some, some movement in the, in the upper and lower extremities. And then if there is no movement, I would definitely flip back. Uh, but in, as you know, from in severe stenosis with myelopathy, you could certainly either not have signals or lose signals very quickly, just, you know, without having a clinical uh, consequence. So right. I, I agree with you. If, if I know there's compression from hematoma or infection or tumor, I'm proceeding with the decompression. I, I, I think you did a great job of that. Right. And, and we decided against pre-op embolization as well. Uh, again, due to the, um, how quickly he presented, we just felt he needed his core decompressed. So I'm glad in retrospect that we did what we did here. You can see there's a lot of lateral mass fixation that's non-existent here. And that's because his facets were completely obliterated by tumor on both sides, especially on the left side. So his first lateral mass fixation is actually at C5. And, um, you know, the reason I took him up to the occiput was, was a couple of reasons. There was really no good landing zone at C2. There was a, uh, there was a par slash pedicle fracture on one side. This is blastic bone. And as we're all aware, uh, there's really no good cortical cancellous tactile feedback when you put these screws in. So I really wasn't too keen on placing a screw into C2. And um, uh, even though I'm very comfortable placing C1 lateral mass fixation, there was a lot of tumor that was blocking lateral mass on the left side. And as we all know, that dissection takes uh, a bit of time sometimes. There's a lot of bleeding just from the epidural veins, from tumor. So I felt the quickest way, throw some sublaminar wires in, get him up to the occiput, get his core decompressed, get him out of surgery. And that's basically what we did. And, and I think we had a pretty reasonable outcome here. He ended up walking out of the hospital about two weeks after surgery and ended up going to rehabilitation. He got a lot of function back in his left side. It's not nowhere near normal with his left upper, uh, but definitely about two to three out of five now. And, and I think overall, this was a pretty reasonable outcome. We obviously didn't address this upper thoracic scoliosis. That was not the goal of the surgery. Hence, he still has a little bit of a coronal tilt here. But overall, uh, pretty happy with the outcome in that case. Yeah, yeah Mike, that, that was excellent. 
Oh, sorry, Nader, go ahead, please. So, I mean, that's a fantastic case, and that's uh, you, you'll encounter these difficult um, situations where the decision making, uh, you know, is challenging and should be done on the fly. Now, you know, this is a typical board question. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm sure about neurosurgical board. I'm not sure about the orthopedics board, but I'm, but but loss of signals. Okay, what do you do with loss of signals? And uh, as uh, Ali alluded to, there's a, you go through the algorithm, you know, you need to go through, right. it, stop the music, uh, get the anesthesia, uh, make sure that the electrophysiologist checks the uh, leads, up with the blood pressure, uh, make uh, give some steroids, you can switch to TIVA, you know, and then make sure that the patient is, uh, uh, temperature is okay, and, and, and all that, and then you reverse the last step. Well, the last step here was flipping the patient. <laughs> so right. I think... Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, to me in, in real practice, probably I'll, I'll do the same thing that you did. I'll flip them back, make sure they have an exam uh, and then and then and then go from there, you know, because you need a diagnosis. Is it technical? Is it just poor reserve? It's most likely poor reserve, but but you want to always do your due diligence and you did. And then, you know, you have an exam, then you proceed. But the thing is, like, sometimes if you start a case with no signal, you flip the patient, no signal. I mean, that, that's, you know, you continue. But you losing signals, you need to make an effort to uh, make a diagnosis at least. Um, right. But, yeah, I would have, you know, it's, it's a, a difficult situation. I've faced it, and I've done the same thing that you've done, you know, you know flip them back. And switching to TIVA is, uh, helps a lot. Did you guys use TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia? That really helps... Uh, uh, get, getting some signals that you can monitor back, uh, you know, it's, it's a slower wake up, but um, it, it really helps. Did you guys do that? Yeah, we do that for all of our cases that we run motor evoke potentials for. Ah, to everything. Okay, so use everything. For all. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, excellent. No, a good, yep. uh, excellent, excellent outcome. All right, so I, I think um, I have about uh, 10 or 12 minutes to present another case before Ali is going to take over. So um, this, was, this was probably, I'll preface this case by saying this was probably one of the hardest cases I, I ever did in, in practice during either residency fellowship or as an attending. This was a 55-year-old guy who presented, he was referred to me for a, a rigid chin on chest deformity. He had decreased use of his hands, gait instability, a lot of neck pain, he could not look upright. And he had had multiple anterior posterior uh, cervical thoracic operations at an outside uh, community hospital about a year or two ago. And it's really unclear as to why there was some uh, talk about he'd had a previous trauma, then it got infected. Um, but um, just wait until you see this imaging. It's, it's very, very unusual construct that he had. And his exam, aside from being uh, rigid, he was very myelopathic. He was able to stand and take a few steps and he had a uh, hand intrinsic weakness. So he did not have all of this hardware when he saw me. Um, this was an old image. He only had the anterior hardware by the time he got to my office. Uh, but this was an old image I was able to kind of uh, harvest out of his uh, outside hospital, where he had all of this posterior hardware from about C1 down to about T6. It started pulling out, and the surgeon took everything out at that point. And he essentially uh, presented to me with, with this scan here. So here's his upright scoliosis x-rays. Um, you can see that he's got a kyphosis of his uh, lumbar spine. He's got pretty normal thoracic kyphosis. He's got this rigid uh, chin on chest deformity essentially here with this kind of unusual C2 to T2 anterior construct here. And you can see this is uh, T2 here, this cord signal change and his spinal cord is really draped over this. And when you look at his CAT scan, he has one screw that's backed out at T2 and another one that's at the posterior superior vertebral body margin of T2. You could also appreciate that he's got these multiple uh, kind of harms, corpectomy cages here, and he's completely fused uh, posteriorly and he's completely fused anteriorly at this stage. So uh, this is a tough situation. This is C2, just to show you, uh, he's got no C2 lamina. You cannot place translaminar screws. He's been decompressed basically up to the suboccipital region. You cannot place a right pedicle screw, can't really place a left pedicle screw, not a lot of good landing zones here. And this is what the axial CT scan looks like with that screw that's abutting that upper vertebral body margin here. And he also uh, looks like he's got maybe a little bit of osteopenia, osteoporosis. He's got a fractured T9 and his lumbar spine looks like it's a mess as well. So we're, we're dealing with a real nice deck of cards here, guys. And here's a nice reconstruction that um, one of our MRI technicians was able to render for us. So uh, that's what we're dealing with here. So what would you guys do here? All anterior, all posterior, anterior, posterior. 
And obviously you got to think about other considerations, right? You're going to do traction on him, pre-op traction, intra-op traction. You're going to stage this. And if you do go anterior, you're going to go anterior neck, or you're going to get your thoracic surgeon, maybe do a maneuveriotomy. And I should preface this all by saying, this is really not the most reliable patient in the world. Um, he's not the kind of guy that's going to sit in the hospital for five days in traction. So that's what we've got. What do you guys think? Hey, Mike, uh, uh, somebody from uh, uh, a colleague from, from the chat box actually asked a really good question. What, what's this guy seeing you for? What, what's the chief complaint? Is it neck pain? Is it myelopathy? What's the main issue here? It was kind of all, his main thing was that he could not look straight ahead. The guy for about two years of his life was literally stuck looking at his shoelaces all day. He could not lift his head up. Secondarily, he did have hand intrinsic weakness, but I suspect that was more chronic. And he was, he was very myelopathic too. He was very unsteady on his feet. He could walk, but he needed a lot of assistance to walk. But his main primary issue was he could not look straight ahead and it bothered the bejesus out of him that he was stuck. And so this is, what, this is what bothered me was this right here. <laughs> At the cervical thoracic, at the, at the uh, lower part of this construct, is he fused posteriorly? He or is. He yes, he's, he's completely fused. You can see here, he's, he has some arthrodesis back here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I showed you guys the image before, but, but, but he, he was definitely fused posteriorly though. And you can see he's, he's been decompressed all the way up to uh, the suboccipital region, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're dealing with. And for the sake of time, I'll kind of uh, move forward to show you guys what we did. Um, we did not do a maneuveriotomy. We did not do a sternotomy. I, I consulted multiple people on this, including our own John Shin. I consulted Zia on this and everyone, including those experts, uh, told me you got to go anterior first, right? So I, I put the slide up here that, you know, in these situations, you know, obviously it's good to keep in mind all these parameters, right? Cobb angles, T1 slope, all of this. At the end of the day, patients really just want to have good horizontal gaze. They want to have their, their back of their suboccipital region in line with their thoracic apex and basically their cranial center of mass over their pelvis, right? So all of these fancy parameters aside, we just want people to have horizontal gaze at the end of the day, right? So this is what he looked like when he's in a supine position. He's completely fixed like this. So is there anyone here? I'm just curious, Ali, Nader, that would try to do this anterior first, given what he looks like when you lay him down, he's got to have multiple pillows suspending his head up like this. Or I should say he's spontaneously suspended like this. Yeah, I, I, I would, Michael, honestly, I mean, I, I, you know, it's hard, but I think once, even, even when they're rigid like this, once you apply a little bit of paralytics, you put them in intraoperative traction, you know, you may have to abort, but, uh, you know, my first instinct, that's what I put in the chat box is I would do a front, uh, back front. And I probably, right. I'd have to look at the CAT scan, but I may not touch really the entire construct. I may just cut the bottom end of the construct. Um, yeah, I mean, I may leave, I, I probably wouldn't take out all of that. I would just cut the plate, get that cage out and do a corpectomy there with a, uh, with a new plate and then go to the back. Um, right. I would do a front back front here. At least that would be my plan A. And, and, and that was exactly what my initial plan was too. You could kind of make out, this is his maneuverium here though. So I consulted our ENT surgeon and uh, nobody was very excited about going through the front of his neck given the position that he had. Now, I, I guess my concern was we'd have to crack his chest to access all of this. And you know, what would our goals be here? And it's exactly what you said, where we would do a, you know, a partial corpectomy drill out some of this metal, keep them in traction. Um, but my ENT colleagues were really not too keen on doing this. So I, I did this kind of in an unorthodox fashion. I ended up doing this. I, I did not take the advice of my wonderful mentor just because of uh, the way that he was uh, laying like this. Um, I decided to do this all posterior. So this is, this is his head position when he's all posterior. His head is inside the frames of the Jackson table and his suboccipital region is nowhere near his thoracic apex here. So for the sake of time, I'll show you what we did. Um, we did what we kind of coined a, a posterior metallectomy, if you will. It's kind of a variant of a PSL. And basically what we did was um, we, uh, we basically instrumented him from occiput down to T10. Now keep in mind, he previously had instrumentation all the way down to T6 and he had a fracture at T9. That's why I took him down to T10. And basically we did a partial VCR slash PSO. We drilled out this harms cage that was here from the back. And we also drilled out 
this screw that was here and we utilized a coarse diamond drill bit. I was a little scared to place one of those metal cutting burrs in there. Uh, that's a bit unpredictable around the spinal cord. So you can see that that screw doesn't exist anymore. We drilled that out. We placed one of these uh, temporary rods in here. And then I had my uh, PGY3 and PGY2 with me. I went under the table and we were able to jack the head back. This is a, th a 3D reconstruction of what it looks like after we were finished with our construct here. You can see that that screw uh, is missing. And this is what the final construct looked like. There's a lot of metal in here but we were able to get a pretty acceptable outcome afterwards. And you could see this is what he looked like before our correction. This is what we had him look like afterwards. Again, it's not completely perfect, um, but it's, I think it's significantly better than the way he was before surgery. We, uh, through the grace of God, had no neuromonitoring changes during this operation. And you can see the degree of correction that we had. This is him preoperatively. This is him after surgery that we're now able to get him. Uh, he could finally lay down. This is what things look like afterwards. Now, it does look like that his head is, is kind of looking up at the ceiling here. In real life, he really did not look so pitched forward. It actually was a lot more acceptable than what this x-ray looks like. But I think all things considered, this was a, a fairly decent outcome. But this is uh, by far one of the most challenging, if not the, the hardest case I had ever done as an attending. Wow, that's very impressive, man. So extremely impressive. So which uh, which vertebra is the VCR it's T2? It, it was a T2. So uh, we obviously started doing laminectomies first at that level. We took the facets down at T12, at T23. We exposed the T1 and in the T2 nerve roots. And then we basically just took the pedicles down at that level. But it, it was it was very unnerving. There was a lot of scar tissue from his previous surgery. And really just doing like you uh, would perform a VCR or PSO, the only difference is that you had a screw sticking up at you instead of just bone. So we basically just burred that screw down. We took serial x-rays, made sure that that screw was completely gone. And, and then at that point, um, you know, I was hopeful that I had mobilized the spine enough. And, and I think we did by, um, by evidence of, of what this intraoperative picture looks like. And we were able to, to kind of bring his head back old school style, um, leaving a temporary rod in. We loosened our set caps, allowed the, the rod to slide. And then I had my PGY3 resident tighten everything down once we were able to translate the head uh, more posteriorly here. No, excellent. Yeah, I mean, he looks horizontal, though, on, on that uh, prone view. You can see he's... Uh, um... He has horizontal gaze. Uh, that that, that Yeah, little, it's uh, not it's not perfect. And um, you know, I agree with you, Ali. I think in an, uh, I, idealistically, we go through the front here. But you know, uh, in in this situation, uh, speak for myself, I, I would have wanted to have an approach surgeon, whether it's a thoracic surgeon or an ENT, just to help us out with the manubriotomy. Um, uh, as a standard anterior neck approach is not going to get us the angle that 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 would have been necessary here. So this is why this kind of pushed me towards doing this all posterior here. So, yeah, no, that's, that, I mean, that's obviously a great result. You're right. It's, it's definitely unorthodox. I mean, you can't, you know, VCRs, PSOs, they are, are common, but as far as drilling out the hardware and drilling out the screws, uh, you know, very creative for sure. Um, and the result is excellent. And, and to your point about the axis surgeon and, and the couple of times that I have done uh, sternotomies, uh, you're right. Once you get low enough, uh, you know, it's just a personal bias. I just, I really don't do, you know, partial manubriectomies anymore. Um, right. I did them when I was in training. And then I, just like yourself, I kind of learned from Zia that sometimes it's better to get the cardiac folks on board and they'll just open the sternum. There's less pain, better visualization. So I probably would have done a sternotomy on him. Um, but again, that c comes with its own, <laughs> of course, risks. Uh, but you're not, it's going to be hard to get ENT yeah. to be comfortable that low with hardware and scar, uh, but tough case and, and yeah. obviously a phenomenal, phenomenal outcome. Yeah. In terms of also staging, like anytime, like if you want to do like front back front versus back front back, I preferred back front back. Why? Because going back again through the front, especially if you want to stage it like a different date, a lot of swelling, it's not as easy as the first, you know, it's just swelling accumulates too much, becomes like harder to retract and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually if there's an opportunity front back front versus back front back, I, I like back front back. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I always worry about doing the posterior part after you've done a big anterior neck approach and everything just kind of swells up. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Michael, for those cases. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll change gears a little bit, maybe, maybe show things that, that are a little bit more straightforward for sure. Uh, those were excellent, uh, excellent cases. 
Uh, let's see here. I, a couple, couple of cases that I think will be will be really helpful to to promote some discussion and 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 not an uncommon presentation. Let me put it that way. So basically, and, and some of you may have seen this uh, previously on, on on Twitter and social media and whatnot, but but really this case revolves on how to manage the patient with the uh, thoracic calcified disc slash osteophyte, right? And they're kind of in the same category, but a little bit different. This is a 64-year-old uh, female who presented with progressive myelopathy, full strength on exam, but definitely had asymmetric reflexes and unsteady gait. She's 64, otherwise healthy, and certainly uh, from a medical perspective, a, a surgical candidate. And uh, she has, uh, uh, this is the t Basically, the remainder of her imaging is, is really unremarkable, but the, these are the key images at T910 and T1011. Um, I know Wendy's with us. She's, uh, Dr. Gibbs, are you, can you hear me? I know she's in and out of uh, procedures. She, she may jump right back on board. Um, but, but this is what, what she's got, uh, T910 and T1011. You know, it's tough to tell. Maybe at the 910 level, a calcified disc, and maybe the level lower down in osteophyte. You know, it starts these these two categories or two entities starts uh, they start to overlap. So the question here, before we talk about this specific case in general, and I'll, I'll ask Nader, uh, Nader, what are your thoughts on patients that come in with with these path these types of pathologies in the thoracic spine, uh, calcified discs, osteophytes? And let's, let's, let's do this. I'm going to make it even harder for you. Their only symptom is back pain, uh, but it's believable. It's back pain, not, not lower back pain. Let's say she, this lady had back pain right at the kind of the thoracolumbar junction, reproducible, maybe even dermatomal, maybe even, you know, pain that goes around to the front at those levels, but pain, no myelopathy with these images. What's your strategy for those? When do you pull the trigger on surgery? If they're not having uh, either acute deficits or, or significant deficits, excellent question. I mean, you know, it's here it's probably more art than a science in terms of approaching this. So pain uh, that is explainable by these findings, but these findings are drastic. Like you have compression, you have cord signal change. It's not. It's it's uh, it's real pathology, and uh, that needs attention. So definitely I will discuss this with the patient. I'll give them a diagnosis. Tell them, okay, your pain is coming from the calcified disc. Now, we usually treat, uh, you know, like for this one, do you pull the trigger? It's, it's a discussion with the patient. You, tell, you know, tell them, you know, risks of an operation and then the benefits, you know, what are the benefits of an operation like this? Potentially helping with the pain, potentially, but it's not a guarantee. But there are dra dramatic risks. Uh, there are risks also with like just watching it, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, but so, you know, to me, first encounter, I'm not going to pull the trigger on a first encounter uh, because I want to speak with the patient, get to know the patient. I'll definitely follow them closely, have them come back in three months, but I'll start the discussion about an operation uh, for sure, because, um, you know, they need to think about it, they need to think about the risks, but I, I'm inclined usually to pull the trigger earlier than than later because they she has more reserve now than than down the line if if she develops symptoms but if we elect to watch it i want to watch it closely and i'll pull the trigger at any new symptom like any extra symptom I'm pulling the trigger yeah yeah no the, i mean i agree with that the problem with these uh, uh cases become and not for all patients right but for some patients once they know they have potentially a dangerous lesion or a dangerous diagnosis I mean, you know, they can't sleep well at night. If, if they wake up and they, they, you know, twist their ankle, they think it's related to the back. So it's, it's, it's very hard. It's hard for patients. But Mike, Mike Gilgano, I, and I know, uh, I think Mike Selby is also on board. Maybe he wants to type in uh, responses, but, uh, or for other participants, please feel free to type in any thoughts or, or, or comments in the chat box. But Mike Galgano, what's what's your threshold for operating on these thoracic lesions? Let's say it's somebody that comes in with just debilitating pain. They tried pain medicine, they tried injections, they're not myelopathic, they just have back pain. What how do you counsel them? I, I would definitely look elsewhere first. You know, I, I would do our due diligence. I would get 
And I'd get an MRI of the neck if there's any element of neck pain. If there's any element of myelopathy, I'm, I'm looking elsewhere as well. I would definitely look in the low back because, um, you know, that could be a source of low back pain as well. I guess a lot depends on where their back pain is. But if they came in without myelopathic symptoms and they had no myelopathic signs on their uh, neurological assessment with just this scan here, only isolated back pain, I would probably have a difficult time trying to encourage them to have an operation without any signs or symptoms of, of myelopathy. It would be difficult for me to localize their back pain to be coming from a calcified disc. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of patients like this. I had one last year that had about eight or nine that looked like this. They were even larger. He had no back pain at all. He had myelopathy. I did an ACDF on the guy for a huge cervical disc and the guy got better. And I just have been watching the other ones since then. So it's difficult for me to localize the pain just to this. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's reasonable. And I agree. I tend to be quite conservative surgically in the thoracic spine if it's just pain. Um, but but this patient, so this patient actually uh, did have uh, was myelopathic, and uh, we felt that surgery was definitely indicated due to the neurological symptoms, and it wasn't only pain. So uh, I'll, I'll throw it back at, at all you guys. We talked about when to offer surgery, whether it's actual pain, myelopathy, or just deficits. But um, you know, we know overall, academic, you know, textbook. What, what, how you, how do you manage, say, ventral lesions? But let's stay on this case right here. This is the CAT scan. You saw the MRI. You see where the calcifications are. Um, how would you treat this case, Nader? Would you go ventral? Do you think you can get at it posterolaterally? Um, right side, left side. Tell us a little bit about how you think you would do this. I mean, yeah, that's that's uh, in my opinion a textbook case of an anterior transthoracic approach. <laughs> and the, the the question is like, it's this is so nice because okay, uh, right side up versus left side up. Well, it's on on the on the verge of both because we'd say okay, left side up if it's T10 or below, right side up if it's T10 or, or if it's T9 or above, where you kind of keep the heart and uh, uh, great vessels out of the way that's on the verge of you know it's in that junction so probably that's left side up for me because you know uh, uh, um, uh, in terms of an approach for, to avoid liver laceration um, but uh, but yeah tra trans uh, trans thoracic or uh, uh, approach um, uh, anterior approach and then you do a partial corpectomy uh, you know of uh, what's that vertebra in the, in the middle, T10, T10, and then you get to the partial T9, partial T11, make sure you go from normal to normal, and then you can uh, put a uh, rib graft uh, that you harvest on the way in and then a plate laterally. Okay, and so, so you, would put a, you would put rib graft and, and you, you would, so you would fuse, you would, you would fixate, fixate this, although you're just doing partial corpectomies. Yeah, I mean, it's, you can go both ways. I mean, you're there, there's a big defect. You can put the grip graft in, not cage, just a rib graft in that cavity and the small plate laterally. Um, I think while you're there, it's the same exposure. You're not taking more bone than necessary to do the fusion. Just you fill that gap so that it, you know, with, with bone so that it would heal. You know, one Uribe, I believe just put out a, a pretty large case series about these exact types of cases, uh, Ali and Nader. And he actually showed over time that uh, these patients really don't need to be arthrodes. And that's always what I, what I was taught as well when I was at Brown with Zia and Toki and those guys was that, you know, you do a partial corpectomy, it's a decent sized defect, you put a cage in lateral plate. But uh, to my knowledge, Juan Uribe showed that you actually really don't have to do this, especially if you're just taking everything down unilaterally from a, um, from a lateral approach. Yeah. But these are two discs, <laughs> two, two pathologies. Oh, I, I, I agree. I agree. And, and if, if it was in my patient, I probably would do a fusion too because um, I, I would just be concerned that they would develop some element of instability. I've actually done these from an all posterior approach before as well. That's the way I was actually taught to do these. Uh, where I would uh, basically do uh, T9 to 11 pedicle screw instrumentation, take the facets down, maybe take a pedicle down on one side. I do think you could probably get to this just from doing a complete facetectomy at these two levels as well. So I know that's kind of an unorthodox approach. It has worked for me and on several occasions. I think it's safe. It's a reproducible, a reproducible approach and um, it's very familiar to us. So that is an alternate way of doing these as well.
Yeah, Mike, Mike and Nader, I mean, those are all great points. I think as far as going posterior or lateral, um, probably like most of you, I mean, I, I love to go posterior, right? It's just easier, quicker, no access surgeon, uh, especially if you do it open. Uh, excuse me, if you do it, at, you know, if you do it open, you know, you usually get a, an access surgeon. If you do MIS or mini open retropleural, we usually don't. Um, you know, I, I would have liked if this were either a soft disc, uh, Mike Gilgano, I would have either liked if this were either a soft disc herniation, or I don't have a problem with a calcified lesion, but if it were maybe a little bit more lateral, and then I would feel more comfortable posteriorly. So I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm with Nader on this one. I probably am like, you know what, it's just a little bit too ventral for my liking. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. There are some that that are that can do it all posterior, posterolateral, either costal transvasectomy approach. Uh, but for and and that certainly is my go-to procedure. But perhaps for these uh, calcified type of osteophytes or discs, I would have liked to see it a little bit more lateral. What do you think, uh, Mike? Uh, do, do you think uh, I, I agree. It's like a much higher. Much higher rate of getting a CSF leak, I think, if you do this all posterior as well. You just have less control over the ventral spinal cord, for sure. So um, so I, I do think that there's a lot of inherent risk to the spinal cord in, in getting a spinal fluid leak if you do this all posterior. So I, I, I agree with you here, Ali, for sure. Now, the board, yeah. the board question answer to this, <laughs> if it's on the, on the board. No, what now? If, if, if that's a question on the board's exam. You know, calcified disc central. Uh, the people, you know, you want, you know, the expectation is like a trans anterior. anterior anterior approach. Yeah, I mean, right. definitely in real life, you know, with expert surgeons and what have you, um, you can uh, do other uh, excellent surgeries. But like the classic answer answer for a calcified midline disc, even if soft midline disc uh, is a trans thoracic uh, approach. Yeah, great point, Nader. I mean, that you're right. Those are. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That is the uh, that is the textbook answer. So, so here were my thoughts on on this case, uh, and and we'll get to a couple of questions from the audience. But a uh, patient was symptomatic with myelopathy, so I thought surgery was indicated. Again, I tend to be conservative with these if it's just pain, but if it's myelopathy with with cord signal, as as we saw, I, I would proceed with surgery. As far as going, and, and, and I, I agree, I, I tend to be a little bit more classic based when it comes to these ventral midline lesions. I'll go anteriorly. I usually do like the left side, actually, because like many of you, I, I feel more comfortable seeing the aorta, moving the aorta, aorta out of the way as opposed to the venous system. Um, I felt perhaps, let me look at the imaging, I felt perhaps that uh, that top level was probably a little bit easier from the right. Uh, but here, I think you could have gone, you know, here, I think it's dealer's choice, could go right or left, but I do like the left approach most often. Uh, and here, I, I went from the right side, and I did what Nader, what, what you said, Nader, is I did those um, kind of partial, partial corpectomies with, uh, uh, on our way, you know, I take rib and I plug those uh, corpectomy deep or partial corpectomy defects with, uh, with, uh, with ribs. And I'll either put a plate, or in this case, I think I put one rod with two screws, screw above, screw below, and one rod. Um, and here is the, the extent of the decompression. So, and I know Mike Selby uh, put a, a nice note on, on navigation. Now, this was done pre my navigation days. I, may, I probably would have used navigation for this case today, if for no other reason than just to get a CAT scan and make sure that calcification is out or that osteophyte is out. Uh, but I, I decided to go from the right side uh, put the rib cage and, and put in and put in the screws. And I agree, Nader. I don't know if we've really destabilized this patient to necessitate a rib graft or 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 the fixation. But um, I think I just stuck to how I'm usually, you know, how I've done these and how I was trained. But I agree, you could get away without it for unilateral, uh, uh, de uh, lateral decompression. Yeah, Ali, that looks great. That's an awesome result. I'm curious. Did you do a, a transthoracic or did you do a retropleural approach here? Yeah, this, so I, so this was uh, most likely a, an open transthoracic, if, if I recall. Um, I, you know, I trained with Juan, as you know, in Tampa, Florida, and uh, that's when we were playing with the retropleural approach, which is a very good approach. And, and the honest answer for people who, you know, who are with us, and I'll tell you the truth, 
we always try we always started retroplural and about 50 percent of the time the you know the pleura ended up opening and it became a transthoracic case i know now the technology is better and the technique is better and, and juan is obviously very good at it uh, but uh you know quite often i'll go straight to the transthoracic approach the only thing that i have learned from the mis techniques is even if you do go transthoracic there are two things you don't necessarily always need a large chest tube you can still get away with a red rubber catheter but more importantly, and this is where you have to talk to your access surgeon if you're using one, you do not need that 15 to 18 centimeter incision. Even if you're going transthoracic, you should be able to do it in, in a mini open approach, anywhere between seven to nine centimeters, as long as you translate that incision a little bit more posteriorly, right? Your thoracic surgeon is going to want to come in and do a big incision, you know, all the way to the front. You don't need that. Just actually take that incision back. So when I do these, even today, corpectomies, what, whichever, with access surgeons, I'm drawing, you know, I'm, I'm making the incision, I'm, I'm marking it out, and I'm there from the beginning, because that makes a big difference between big, uh, uh, big and small uh, scars, muscle dissection, et cetera. That's my thought. That's my long answer to, to that question, Mike. A, a good question from one of the uh, from one of the uh, participants, which which also going back to the board style questions, uh, and a very common one is how do you deal with negative pressure CSF leak through the ventral approach? So let's say you do this. Luckily, I don't remember getting CSF leak here, but let's say you get a durotomy and it's they're hard to repair ventrally. Well, then what do you do? And that's a great question. It comes up a lot, and it's an important one. So I'll throw it to my colleagues on 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 the call here. So Nader, how how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, you, you, in many different ways. Sometimes people, you know, use reflect the pleura above that defect. But what I would do, I'll try to repair it primarily. I get the scope in. I usually use a scope for this, but not every person gets a, uses a scope. But for dural tears in general, I'll get the scope in. I'll try to repair it primarily if I can't. I'll put a patch, and then I'll want to put a lumbar drain. Um, uh, you know, you know, put a patch to seal and then uh, lumbar drain that person, uh, you know, just be aggressive up front with with uh, with a, with a CSF leak. Yeah, Ali, I, got this, I got this exact question on my oral boards back in May, the exact question about this. And it was exactly what Nader had said. Um, you know, first you try primary repair, then you go forth with with lumbar drainage. Um, I had one case during my training where we had this persistent CSF leak. We actually placed an external ventricular drain, which believe it or not worked as well. So we had a lumbar drain and an EVD draining CSF from both ends uh, that actually worked. And I think as an absolute last resort, if you really have to, you could do a posterior approach. If you can't get this patient to really stop uh, leaking CSF into their pleural space, you can do a posterior approach and you can wrap the spinal cord. It's a big, it's a big procedure at that point. Um, I've done that before. Um, in certain situations where you circumferentially decompress the spinal cord and you basically get some type of alloderm or, or uh, something of that sort. And you basically just wrap the spinal cord like a burrito at that point. That's an alternative way, but that would be an extreme answer to this. So, You just wanted to bring that discussion back to the posterior approach, Mike. I trained with Zia. Uh, I know you did too, but... Uh, he has got me trained on doing virtually everything posterior. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, no, no. I'm, 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 I do I'm, do some laterals though once once in a while, but posterior uh, I'm biased for. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm actually the pendulum is swinging in my practice for for uh, a much more posterior than lateral approach. Uh, so I agree with both of you. That's exactly my algorithm for. Uh, uh, I don't I don't know. Somebody asked it up top. Uh, I, I agree with you. The only the only additional things uh, I would say is um, talk if you are using an access surgeon and you do have a, tube, a chest tube, talk to them, make sure they don't put it to suction. So keep it on water seal. I think that's a big one. Um, and also you're right, lumbar drain, like Nader said, leave it in for three days, five days. And worst case scenario, and we've had to do this a couple of times, there's nothing wrong with a temporary lumboperitoneal shunt, right? You put a lumbar drain and they do great. You clamp it, you know, they're symptomatic again. And so the final resort for really for any CSF leak or, or, or a challenging recurrent CSF leak uh, surgically is a lumboperitoneal shunt. That's the last resort. And it almost always works. They seal over time, over a few weeks to a few months, the shunt stops working. You can even come back and take it out. So, uh, but the big ones for me here, uh, like these guys said, is try to repair primarily otherwise lumbar drain, 
chest tube never to suction and uh, lumbar drain. Those will should take care of the vast majority of the issues. Do you guys agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, guys, we have eight more minutes. And so we're going to change uh, directions. As, as a lot of you know, I have a, I enjoy a diverse practice and I do primarily adults, but some, some pediatrics. So I wanted to show this case. Um, this is a 11-year-old a, 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 a uh, female premenarcho with a history of uh, couple file syndrome, KFS. She actually had a Chiari and uh, a OC fusion by uh, one of my partners several years ago. And uh, some of you know that, uh, uh, that in couple file, they have complex you know, cranial vertebral junctions and, and they're, uh, I would say, one of the uh, rare patients or, or patient demographics that actually is a good candidate for OC fusion. That's a completely different topic altogether, but I, a lot of you may wonder why this patient got, got it. So needless to say, she had OC fusion and then um, my partner referred her to me for her, uh, uh, for, for her scoliosis, which again, not uncommon in couple file, especially uh, with uh, multiple fusions in, 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 younger pa in younger patients or in the growing spine. So neurologically, she was intact, motor five out of five, no sensory deficits. Um, she had that, the obvious truncal shift and the shoulder asymmetry, no leg-leg discrepancy, which should always be checked on anybody uh, with uh, or, uh, any kid with scoliosis. And her MRI imaging uh, did not show any intraspinal anomaly. And that's another question that comes up when you see adolescents, whether it's AIS or, or congenital uh, scoliosis, you know, when do you get MRIs? And, and I would say in speaking to a lot of people who do a lot more of these than I do, the trend is towards getting MRIs more often than not. I think classically speaking, if you speak to surgeons who do a lot of uh, idiopathic scoliosis, they will say if the reflexes are normal, the exam is benign, there's no need for it. Uh, but I would tell you that a lot of folks are moving towards getting MRIs for, for even those patients. It's almost always recommended for patients with congenital scoliosis and, and syndromic scoliosis like this. So here's her pre-op imaging. Again, she had a previous OC fusion up top that, that she did well from. Um, uh, I think, yes, I do have the CAT scan and the subsequent image to demonstrate the, uh, the auto fusions in the mid and lower thoracic spine. And she has a greater than 45 degree curve, which is now we're getting towards surgical territory, right above 45 degrees. Um, and, and so here's her uh, PA, here's her lateral. Not unusual for these patients to have a lordotic thoracic spine, unfortunately, not a kyphotic spine. And, and here's her, her CAT scan showing the congenital lesions, um, uh, multiple fused segments, um, and, and which obviously was contributing and, and really causing her scoliosis. And as far as the decision to operate, I, I did this a few years back, but again, we had imaging that demonstrated a, uh, a progressive uh, curvature, progressive increase in the curvature as well. Uh, as clinically, you know, the family is noticing that she definitely has more truncal shift and is kind of falling over on the side. So, and I know, uh, I know Mike, you do some, uh, some pediatrics and I know Mike Selby does as well. So Mike Selby, feel free to chime in as well as uh, other colleagues, but what, what are your thoughts uh, on, on this type of case with, with her fusion? Uh, you know, she's not going to be the classic Ponty, let's correct straight type of patients, but um, I'll take any thoughts on this from, uh, from you guys. Ali, do you have any bending films on her, like, like over a fulcrum or supine films? Great question. I have supine films. I didn't get uh, bending films on her. I usually get bending for the AIS, for the folks with congenital scolies uh, like her, where you know she's fused at the apex there. You're not going to expect a lot of motion there, but you, will get, but you will get obviously motion and flexibility above and below. Great question. Right. I, I don't really, this doesn't really strike me as a case where you could just get away with something like a selective thoracic fusion. Um, you know, my concern here is that the patient's pre, pre menarchal uh, I believe, correct? Uh, yeah. So the patient likely has a fair amount of growth potential left. And, you know, the concern with stopping short 
of uh, inclusive, uh, sorry, including that lumbar curve is that these patients might go into developing like a crankshaft deformity just because they still have more potential for osseous growth later on. So this is a patient, in my opinion, that's probably going to end up needing a three-column osteotomy just because based on that CAT scan, it looks like that they have about three to four few segments here if you really want to get some, some kind of a reasonable correction here and uh, maybe give them back some of that thoracic kyphosis as well. Yep. Okay, yeah, those are great points, Mike. I, I agree with you. So number one, you know, the first concept is this is not going to be a selective thoracic. She has a, a pretty significant lumbar curve in addition to this thoracic curve. Um, she's got that hardware up top. So there's a lot, you know, she's still growing. So, you know, there's gonna be some issues there. And as far as the three level, uh, the three level uh, uh, fusion or the, the three column osteotomy, it's, you know, where do you select it? Do you just do it at the apex at T9, T10? I think you can get a really nice reduction and correction with that. So I agree with you, great points. Talk to the family about all of those options. Um, obviously the three column osteotomy here is going to give you a much higher uh, you know, risk profile. Remember she's 11. Um, and so we talked about all the options and, and this is what I end up doing in terms of risk benefit. Um, I ended up doing T3 to L4, a little bit lower than I would like, but there was, again, still a significant lumbar curve to it. Um, uh, we did this, I have the times here, but at about six hours, I used to have plastic surgery come and close these. These are the intraoperative pictures. And what I did, Mike, is I ended up doing Ponte's above and below, but I did not do a VCR or three column at those. I felt that there was enough flexibility in the patient because she's young and because she otherwise has a flexible spine uh, above and below and was able to get her under 25 to 30 degrees, which is really the target for a lot of these kids, um, especially for the congenital scolies, it's really, uh, and, the, and the syndromic ones, it's, as you know, it's challenging and, and almost unsafe to try to get a perfect alignment and you get a stretch injury. Still is lordotic, unfortunately, in the thoracic spine, that really didn't change. Uh, but certainly a much better, but much better coronal reduction, uh, correction, excuse me. And, and most importantly, of course, clinically, this is how she looked immediately after surgery. So, you know, could, I think we could have made the images better with the VCR. Um, I, I thought that was a much higher risk profile for this 11 year old with congenital uh, scoli. Uh, and I thought we could get this clinical picture uh, without doing that and doing Ponte's above and below. So that's what I decided to do. And, and, and I know she, I followed her for a couple of years uh, in my previous practice. Uh, she did, she's a superstar, superstar child who's had a, a lot of surgeries, but did absolutely great. So just a little bit, of, I wanted to change things up a little bit and talk about um, something that we don't talk about too often, which is these congenital uh, scolies in the, in the uh, young adults and adolescent population. Any comments or thoughts? Yeah, Ali, I think that this is an awesome result. Um, the proof is in the pudding with these pictures. You know, you don't have to make the x-rays uh, completely straight as a pin in these situations. I, I think you chose the, the safest route. And, um, you know, given her situation of this not being a typical AIS case and having had previous surgery, uh, I, I probably in retrospect probably would have done the same exact thing that you did. Obviously, maximize correction, three-column osteotomy, sure, but... Um, you know, we don't want to make a picture look pretty. We just want the patient to be happy and, and neurologically intact when they wake up from surgery. So I think you absolutely took, took the, uh, the, the right avenue with this. Uh, I think it's an awesome result. Yeah, that was my thought. It's, it's really just, you know, the, the, the correction, I think, in, neuro, uh, in, in congenital and syndrome, it's a little bit different than AIS, and it's the spinal cord is less forgiving. And, and I didn't feel that was a great idea. But um, anyways, wanted to show something that's a little bit different. Uh, sorry, we're about one minute over, so I apologize. We don't have time to bounce back to Mike, but uh, great cases all around. I, I, Nader and, and, and Mike, thank you for the great discussion. Uh, Dr. Gibbs, Mamagani, Selby, um, and uh, thank you guys all for joining us today. We had a really nice showing. I think Dr. Gibbs and Mamagani are, are tackling next week. Any, any thoughts from you guys? What's, uh, what are we in for? Yeah, we, we uh, decided to um, to give a talk about something we have never heard, I guess. It was a cement, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, what to do and what to not to do. Oh, I think that's awesome. That's a great topic. So uh, basically cement, when to do it, when not to do it, what to do with it. I think that's a great topic. Very, very pertinent. <laughs>
Yeah, we want to invite all the radiologists who, who think they can do better than than us surgeons and uh, I oh, no. it could be a controversy um, I, I bet you they can. I bet you they can do better. I'll tell you one thing, they certainly do do it less invasively than we do in the OR. They can do it in this in the in the IR suite, which I'll i never feel comfortable doing it there. That's a great topic. So all right, everybody, we'll uh, we'll reconvene next week. Thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of uh, the week and we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks guys.